best husbands we can possibly be, the best fathers we can possibly be, the best mothers, the best wives, the best sons and daughters, the best brothers and sisters in Christ. We can do this. We can do this because God has a plan. It doesn't take a lot of creativity, creativity on our part. We just simply stick with the word, apply the word, and we do have better families, stronger families. In previous lessons, we studied how, according to God's plan, in order to have better, stronger families, we need to leave our parents, we need to cleave to our spouse, and we need to weave, we need to become one flesh. There needs to be a closeness that, that the devil cannot possibly penetrate. And then also we noticed in order to have better and stronger families, according to God's plan, we need to have marriages that are enjoyable. We need to have fun. We need to smile. We need to like what we're doing together. We need to look forward to the moments where we can have good, healthy communication. We also talked in previous lessons about how we need to make sure that Jesus is Lord of our homes, that he is boss, if you will, of every conversation of everything that's decided, of every meal, of every interaction that we possibly have, that Jesus actually is Lord of us. In homes where Jesus is Lord, obviously then there's going to be great joy, health, and stick to We're just not going to want to get away from each other when Jesus truly is Lord. Then we also studied together how we need to spend quality time with our spouse. We noted from Deuteronomy that back in the day when a man uh, enlisted in the army, if he was a good soldier, that good soldier could actually take a year's vacation, not just from his work as a military man, but also from other responsibilities in the community if he became husband. Got married, got married, society understood, God understood, these people need time together to learn about each other, to, to help each other, to grow closer to each other without these other distractions of job or war. And now tonight, I want to encourage us in this direction to have better and stronger families. Let's make sure that we do our very best to model the behavior that we model the behavior that we desire our spouse to have. Talked in Bible class actually this morning just a moment about this, but the idea, the idea that I need to go out and find the right person, I mean, we understand that has some merit, that has some validity as we're looking for somebody to marry. But, but the most important matter to determine is self. And, and the most important thing is not necessarily go out and, and find the right person, but for each of us to be the right person, be the right person. We want a generous spouse, let's be generous ourselves. If we want a, a, a loving spouse, let's be loving. If we want a spouse who's kind, let's be kind. You know, and this has broad application, not just to the to marriage relationship, but if we, want, if we want those kind of children, that's the way we should be. We want those kind of brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what we need to do. We need to model the behavior we desire of each other. I'm thinking particularly about 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Listen to what the apostle said. This is 1 Peter 3, verse 1. He said, Wives, likewise, be submissive. Be submissive to your own husbands. That Notice this, that even if some do not obey the word, they, notice, without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. So you've got, <laughs> you've got a lady, she's married to a man, and it's not working out so well because he's not godly. He's not talking the way he should talk. He's not thinking the way he should talk. He's not treating her respectfully. And what Peter says is somewhat revolutionary, and probably in their day controversial, saying basically stop arguing about it. Stop arguing about it. Try manner of life. Try living in front of him the way you want him to be so that without your words, but he can just see how you are and, and maybe what you're doing will rub off on him and he'll learn to be loving. He'll learn to be kind. He'll learn to be generous. He'll learn to be forgiving. He'll learn to be godly because he sees those traits in you. Again, it's not so much in, in working on the other person to effect change, but working on ourselves and what we need to become and what, what we need to do. It, we, we looked also earlier, why, but while we're open in 1 Peter 3, just want to remind you 
of, of what verse 7 said. It said, Husbands, likewise dwell with them, meaning your wife, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together for the grace of God. And here's why I'm reading this passage, that your prayers may not be hindered. See, this, this marriage relationship is so important because it affects every other relationship we have. And what Peter's saying is it especially affects the marriage relationship. We want to have a great relationship with God, we need to have a great relationship with our spouse. We need to try to have a great relationship with our children. We need to have a great relationship as best we can with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes, maybe you've observed this, I have the unique ability to put my foot squarely in my mouth. And I was preaching years ago, and, and there, was this, there was this couple, they were seated to, to my right over in, the, over in the youth section tonight. Not in this congregation, not in this building, but in another place, they were seated over there, and they came in about the time we were going to start, we say fashionably late, and he sat on one end of the pew, and she sat on the other end of the pew. So I get up preaching, I look over, and that's just kind of peculiar to me. And I think it, I say something like, well, you guys must be arguing at each other tonight or something. Move on, preach. And then after church, what did I learn? They were arguing with I just I thought maybe they're saving seats for other, you know, kids coming in late, something like that. And they were arguing, and, and, and they, they, they came in in a, in, a, in a bind. Now, did they have good worship that night? Did that, did that affect their ability to sing and pray and, and to, to put themselves into the worship and receive from the worship and be edifying to those around? It absolutely did. Now, thankfully, it wasn't a permanent squabble, and they, they got it worked out with sense of humor and all those good things and God being in control once again. But it can affect us, right? It can affect us. And so how do we get that other person to be what they need to be? Peter says, if I will be what I ought to be, that, that'll help. Or at least he, he suggests that we try that to see if that might bring about. Anybody here, anybody here enjoy being fussed at? Anybody really like that? Anybody? Probably not. So it is just reasonable if we don't like it when other folks fuss at us, and if that's not the best way to motivate change from us, then why would we think that harping and nagging and continuing to just belittle and gripe, that that's going to bring about positive change? And what that would probably do, you talk about earlier, you know, that leaving, cleaving, weaving, this is the way God wants us to be this close, but won't that nagging and all, won't that put, put distance between ourselves and that spouse? And so... Maybe Peter's on to something here. If, and and it, doesn't this kind of go along with what Solomon said a long time ago? He said, he said, as iron sharpens iron, one friend sharpens or one man sharpens another. See, why did Adam get Eve? Why was she given to him? Because he was incomplete without her. Because he needed help, a help me to help her. And she needed the same. But, but they, they assisted each other in their growth and development and their life. And so one man with one woman, they, they can enhance, they can improve each other. We really should have better lives because we're with this person and because this person is with us. You remember, this, this kind of just, just meshes so well with, with what we learned earlier about Abram, who became Abraham in Genesis 18, 19. You know, he, he desired his children to be a certain way, and so he went that way first. For I know him, the text says, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. They're going to do as Dad did, and they're going to be all right. Now, probably Abraham told them what to do on occasion, but according to this text, the emphasis is not on what he told them to do, but on what he showed them to do. He showed them to do it by the way he lived Life, You know, some folks that we marry, they, they come into the relationship with different baggage, different experiences, different predispositions, different... And, and so, so it, it may take time for us to, to get on the same page, get on God's page. And, and one of the best things we can do, according to Peter, not fuss. Not fuss. And, and we, probably we don't have this challenge in our congregation but, but there are some couples, some people, and some congregations that do struggle with this. Let us never be guilty of arguing in front of our children. 
I'm kind of like a lot of you. I grew up in a home that some folks would say is dysfunctional. And I can tell you from experience, now my mom loved my dad, my dad loved, but they had some issues. And I can tell you from experience, the scariest sounds I ever heard, even more scary than my daddy saying, get me a belt. Well, that was pretty scary, but more scary than that was to try to lie in bed at night and hear mom and dad in the other room screaming at each other. Is it my fault they're doing this? Are they going to start hitting each other, I'm thinking? Are they going to get a divorce? Is, is my life going to, you know? That's scary. That's scary. And, and so we can't, we can't spare our children a lot of things that would lie to us. We can't protect them from a lot of things. We understand that. It's just a nature of life. devil's going to get in and he's going to connect every now and then. But let's spare them that. Let's, let's, let's try to, to raise our children up in a home where they did not hear us screaming, yelling, threatening. Now, they may hear disagreement, and, and sometimes that could be, understand certain kinds, that could be healthy if, if they hear reasonable disagreements and they see, yeah, mom and dad, they can disagree, but they still love each other, and here's how they calmly come to consensus and agreement and work it out, and they're happy. And I would encourage us, if we have been guilty of having these arguments in front of our children, to teach them now, to say to them now, that's not the best way. But sometimes, Mom and Dad, we just get emotional, and we, we say some things we don't mean that. We love each other, and forgive us, and let's pray about it, and we're going to try to do better. We're going to try to do better. What Peter's saying is, let, let's shut down the, the arguments, and let's work on our example Let's work on how we treat each other, how we, how we model the behavior again that we want other people. You know, we, we talk about in parenting, we want to have a faith worth imitating. Well, let's have a faith that's worth imitating for our spouse as well. Then also, we, as we try to stick with God's plan for better, stronger families, let's, let's get in our minds thinking for just a moment about what, what Garrison read from Ephesians about this idea of having... The kind of love that produces a submission that is mutual. Having a love that's going to result in kind words and kind deeds. Since Garrison read from Ephesians, I want to read from Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. You're familiar with this. It's just a matter now of us practicing it. This is Ephesians 3, 17 and following. What did I say? Ephesians? And my Bible was reading my mind, too, and listening to it. I don't know why this Bible does that sometimes. I still miss that old Bible. Y'all remember how I described it? I could think of passage, and that Bible just go to it. But this Bible tries. All right, now I'm in Colossians. Now I'm in Colossians. That'll be better. Colossians 3, listen to 17. And whatever you do, you got that? That's a broad umbrella. Whatever you do. In word, whatever you say or deed, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then he says, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So that's the test, isn't it, of, of how we talk and how we do, particularly in our family, but this goes beyond the, the walls of the house. Is what I'm doing something that God would be pleased with? Is this something that I can... I can be thankful to him that I'm, I'm having this attitude. I'm having these, these kinds of words. I'm having this, this kind of behavior. Earlier, remember, Paul gives us the does it glorify God test. You know, whatever you do, whatever you, whatever you think, whatever you put your hands to, whatever you put your mind to, whatever you're involved in, be sure that it glorifies God. Can the way I talk to her, can I honestly say that's glorifying God? Can the way I'm... Pounding that wall, can I say that's honestly glorifying God? The way I'm pouting, is that glorifying God? Is the way I'm pitching a fit, is that glorifying God? If I'm using profanity towards her, towards him, is that glorifying God? If I'm issuing ultimatums, is that glorifying God? If it doesn't glorify God, it doesn't enhance the family. It weakens the family, and, and we've got to work on it. Again, this is God's plan for having better, stronger families. And then he goes on to say, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Then he goes to this with the husbands. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter 
toward them. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry is another way of putting that. And then he goes on to talk about the kids. Children, obey your parents in all things. Jesus could do it. We can do it. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Then fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And now, kids may really love that passage. In the original, the idea is, is to not be, and kind of combine that with Ephesians 6, 4, where we're, we're, not to, we're not to raise angry or bitter children. Fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but don't provoke them to anger. You understand? But, but the idea there is, because sometimes we recognize that whenever we ask a child to clean their room, they're going to get angry, and he's not prohibiting us from saying, clean your room, or be, be home by 11 o'clock at night, or 9 o'clock at night, or whatever. He's not saying that the, the parents shouldn't make boundaries and enforce those reasonable boundaries. What he's saying here is that, that we should not be oppressive and so harsh that our children are just bitter and resentful and, and rebellious. Again, the model to follow here in being a good father is, is, is God's model, is, is God's behavior towards us. He has certain rules. He has certain boundaries. He has certain e expectations, commandments of us. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my... If we, if, if we have proper respect for God, for his son, we're going to do what he's told us to do. And, and we're not going to be bitter towards him. We're not going to be angry. We'll understand the reason he gives us the bedtime, the reason he gives us the, the prohibition against running with knives or whatever it is is because he loves us. He's not trying to spoil our fun. He loves us. But there are some fathers who, who just get into this big ego. I'm the boss. I'm going to do what, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to expect the kids to live a different way than I'm living, and I've got all these requirements and expectations. And it's just overly oppressive, and that raises bitter and rebellious children. And, and that's, his, that's what is of great concern to, to our brother Paul here. But the idea is, in the home, and you, you combine that with what Garrison read, read earlier from Ephesians, there is to be mutual. The first verse he read there, 21 and 22, before he gets into the wife submitting to the husband, the idea there is that, that we are to submit to each other. And we used examples about, about this before, that if, if she really feels strongly about something and it's not going to compromise my faith or it's not going to cause me to do something that just is going to make me absolutely miserable, I ought to try to do that. If, if I want her to do something, if it's not going to destroy her, self-esteem, self-worth, and all that, then, then really, she ought to try to do that. We ought to try to compromise and work with each other and help each other. And, and again, that's such a great model for our children. Our children are learning how to be husbands and wives by the behavior they observe from mom and dad. And one of the best gifts we give our children is to love their parent, love their other parent, and, and to show them that in the home we can be submissive to each other. We can use kind words to each other. You remember... Ephesians 4, before he talks about the specific responsibilities of husband, of wife, of, of children, he, he mentions that we're to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. The place we need to be most kind and most forgiving, most tender, is certainly in our homes, in our homes. And let's not fall back on the excuse, well, that's not the way I was raised to be. It doesn't matter. Many of us were not raised to be Christians, and yet we're Christians. We maybe weren't raised to be fantastic fathers. We still can get that done. Maybe we weren't raised to be fantastic moms and, and spouses. We can still follow God's plan, and we can get that done. We really can. Treat each other respectfully, kind, kindly, the way. You know, it's just practicing Matthew 7, 12, doing to others the way we'd want others to do. Would you really want someone to treat you the way you just treat you? You know, one of the things that's kind of frustrating, you see folks that treat total strangers better than they treat their spouse, better than they treat their children. Having knocked down drag out at some restaurant, the waiter walks up, he's a complete stranger, random person, and we're polite to that one. I mean, it's good to be polite to that one, but why can't we be as polite to the one that we pledged our lives to? The ones we're raising up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Is there, may I ask you this thing about this, is there ever a reason to be rude? To anybody, at any time, anywhere. Is there ever a time to be rude? Maybe you can think of, maybe there is a time. I just can't think of it right now. And certainly we would say, there's never a time to be rude to those 
that we love so much that, that we're living in that house with. There's just no space for it. There just really, really isn't. In spite of what we see on television, there's no, no, no place, no space for that. Something else we need to do according to God's plan, we need to keep the lock in wedlock. We need to keep the lock in wedlock. I'm not sure why this has become over the years such a controversial thing when we talk about, talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. When I look in my Bible and I read what Jesus said, to me it's pretty simple. And I may not be able to figure out all the various combinations in, in every particular scenario, and I just confess that to you. But when I read what Jesus says, I can always figure out, and so can you, what is safe. We know what's safe, don't we? What is the safest of all possible choices? This is Matthew 19. Let's just read what Christ says and let's just sign our names to it and let's agree with it. By the way, whether we agree with it or not, this is the way God expects it to be. And this is Matthew 19, beginning in verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? I'm just tired of her. She's tired of me and we're just going to separate. Can we do that? Here's what Jesus says. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Now that's not popular today. But he really did. He made them male and female. Not male to be with male or female to be with female. He made them male and female. And said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. Again, that's a male and a female. The man shall leave. Male, female, father, mother, and be joined to wife. Man shall be joined to wife. Wife is woman. Male be joined to female. And by the way, what God has defined, we don't need to try to redefine, do we? And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God had joined together, let not man separate. That seems pretty simple. That seems pretty understandable. It's not just a contract between a party of two. It's a contract between a party of three. It is man, woman, God. And we're not to break, according to Christ. Let not man separate. They said to him, why they did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning... It was not so. And here it is, verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries, whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Let's find a way. Let's find a way to stick and stay. Um, let's not allow ourselves to... to get a divorce simply because we're tired of living with this person and it's not fun anymore. I don't read that here. I don't read, I don't read about irreconcilable differences here. I'm not trying to be, am I, am I trying to be judgmental? No, am I trying to be, un you, you understand, I'm just reading what Jesus is saying and I'm saying that, that this is God's plan for us, for better, stronger families. And so let's find a way to, to work out our differences without having to break that contract that we made long ago with our spouse and with our Heavenly Father. And then also to have a great and godly home, to have these better, stronger families. Let me mention this. We need to have a faith that will be passed on to future generations. You know, I was talking about this in a presentation I made at, at last to leaders, how... We want to do things now that make sure not only that our children will be faithful, but our children's children and the next generation after them. And I'm thinking about 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul's bragging on Timothy. Not so much about Timothy's faith. Where did he get his faith? He got his faith from, from his mother. What was her name? Eunice. Easy for me to remember that because that's my mother's name. And who did Eunice get her faith from? Grandmother. Grandmother's name was Lois. Isn't it wonderful to have that? That is a family tradition. 
where granny's got faith and mama's got faith and the children's got faith and we pass that faith on to the you know, the, the greatest gift we'll give our children is faith. Now, I understand there's some discussion in Bible classes and certain ways of teaching this, right? We want their faith to, to become their own faith, and they embrace it, and they're not just believers because we're believers. And I get all that, but, but that's not exactly the way Paul put it. He said, I'm thankful that you got mama's faith, and, and mama got, got granny's faith. Let's not be apologetic for trying to instill belief in God. Is it really our faith? Our belief is, it should be the faith of every sensible person. It should be the belief system of every sensible person. Understand, i got a choice. I can believe I came from nothing or I came from God. I choose God. Is that my faith? Well, it's, again, it's true. And so let's, let's teach those things. Let's pass that on to our children. Let's make that our highest priority. I, I know it's important that our, our children learn all these these things in life that will help them to be successful, athletically successful, academically successful, socially. But, but let's help them to be successful spiritually. And then, last of all, last of all, let's learn to say 12 special words. And this kind of sums up all the things we've been talking about last uh, Sunday morning, last Sunday night, and, and now tonight. 12 very special words. Can you say these words if you needed to say these words. Maybe you've never needed to say these words. I routinely do need to say these words. Can you say this? I was. Can you say that next one? I was wrong. You're wrong. That's easy. Right, that comes out. I just don't even have to try for that one. I was wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> How long has it been since you've been wrong? Probably not, not long ago. How long has it been since you said, I was wrong? Should be simultaneous occurrences, shouldn't it? Right after we learn we're wrong, and if you're wrong, she'll tell you, so you'll know. Or he'll tell you, you'll know, I was wrong. I was wrong. That helps. And then this next, I am sorry. And don't say it with an attitude. I'm sorry you're offended. <laughs> that doesn't sound like we know what the word sorry means. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I am sorry. I'm sorry you're acting the way you're at. No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry we're having struggles. I'm sorry that... I am sorry. I was wrong. I am wrong. I'm sorry. And then, this is so beautiful. People talk about magical words. I don't know about magic. I just know this helps us. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I've had people, not lately, thankfully. Don't test me. Don't, don't make that an inaccurate statement. But I've had people in, in my lifetime that have been angry with me, maybe for good cause. Maybe I said something I shouldn't have said, did something. Maybe it wasn't intentional, but whatever, they were upset. And, and I didn't know what to say. You know, sometimes I think God answers our prayers and helps us to be wiser than we really are. I found myself in numerous situations where I really think that's happened. I hear things coming out of my mouth saying, I'm not that smart, but that came out anyway, so that's God answering prayer. One of the ways God has answered some of my prayers is to teach me and to help me to say, is please forgive me. Please forgive me. I, I mentioned this in a, in a class one time. A lady was irate with me. Not this lady, but another lady. I pointed that way. It was another, she was just irate with me. I had not visited, she thought, I had not visited someone in her family that was at that time sick and, and essentially dying. I had actually gone to that person's house with an elder. But this lady didn't, didn't know it or didn't want to know it. The problem kind of broke down because when we went to the house to see that person was not able to hear, not able to come to the door, something like that. And then the person stepped into a turn. This woman was irate. And so I explained to her I had visited successfully this person earlier and had returned with an elder to visit. And they didn't come to the door. We don't know why. And I, she just thought I was lying. I guess, and she refused, she just was, she'd made up her mind she was going to be angry with me and stay angry with me. And so 
I, I really, I had every right, I think, to just argue with her and say, I, I was there, and, and you shouldn't be, ain't, why, this is nothing to be upset about. You're, you're acting childish. I could have probably reasonably said that. That would worked well, being like baptizing a cat. But, but I did not say those things. I just, I, just, I just asked her, I said, will you forgive me? You know what she said? Angry woman. I still remember where it was, it was kind of back, of the, back near the lobby here. I said, will you, just, will you forgive me? I said it very kind. Will you forgive me? You know what she said? No. She said no. And, and so then, you know, I'm, okay, I'm going to blast her. I'm going to just let her have it. Now she's being ungodly. But I didn't. Again, God answers prayer. And I, I said to her again, I said, I said will, you, will you just please forgive me? You know I love you. Will you just forgive me? And I expected a yes this time, and she didn't say yes. And so her husband's standing there, witness to all this. He's a great man. They, these folks stepped into her a long time. I think I preached at both their funerals, but he put her, his arm around her and said, Honey, he said he's sorry. He said forgive him. Just forgive him. And she forgave. And ultimately, her anger subsided, and we developed a great relationship as time went on. There are so many people in life that are hurt. And it may not be anything you said. It may not be anything you did. They, they, they were born hurt. Right? They, they're not happy if they're happy. And, and, and so their issue is not with you. It's with, it's with life. And those people need to hear from us that we're sorry sometimes. They need to hear from us. Please, you think, oh, no, 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 they just need a punt. No. No, no, no. We're not to do unto them as they're doing to us. We're to do unto them as we'd like for them to do unto us. We'd like for them to be kind and gentle and nice. And, and that works. The, these words, I was wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And then this one. I love you. I love you. I hope. I hope we never hang the phone up in anger where we don't say, I love you. I, I hope we never slam a door and walk away without calming down and saying, I love you. I, I hope we never, you know, our last words, so, some of you do this so well, y'all taught us that you, you never know when will, you'll have your last conversation. You want to make sure that if it's going to be your last one, the last words your kids, your spouse going to hear, hey, I love you. <laughs> I may not like what you're doing, right, but I love you. I really, really love you. Now, we got a problem. We got a, I don't like the word problem. We got a challenge, right? Because some of this older generation, even that we're worshiping with tonight, you know, they never heard mom and dad say those words. So don't take it too personally if they, if they don't tell you. They, 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 they just kind of stuck on that. And they refuse to acknowledge that. They just want, They can't quite get to that point yet. Don't take it personally. This is a lot more about them and their reason than it is about you. And they love you. Trust me, they love you. They just man, think the sky would, would fall on their heads or the earth would open up and swallow them if they became a more communicative person about this, I love you. If that's you, if it's really tough for you to, to, to you know, one of the best ways to overcome something like that is just redouble your efforts to do it. For example, if you got a, a, a struggle with giving, I, I talked to a guy one time, he, he very blessed. He said, he said, you know how I learned to give more? Every time the devil started tempting me to not be so generous, not give so much on Sundays, I'd just double it. I'd double it, and then finally he left me alone. You know, the, the, the more likely you are to not say these words like, I was wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I love you, if you'll just start doubling up on that, It'll come much more naturally, and the devil will remove that temptation of you. Oh, don't, don't be old. That, that's, that's the way women are. That's, that's, that's not for us sissy. No, it's Christ. How many times, how many ways did Jesus say to us, I love you? And we're not so lovely. We're not so lovely. We're not so lovable. But yet he finds a way, and he still does. Even if we don't say to him, I love you, even if we don't obey his will, he loves us. Love is unconditional. Love is agape. Let's, let's do this. These were three stages of marriage. Starts out as ideal. Got issues and it goes to ordeal. Then some folks want a new deal. That's not good. We can have, if we follow God's plan, we can stick with the ideal. 
we can we can have better we can have stronger families and and let's do that you know i'm kind of a stubborn competitive person and and you are too a lot of you and we're, we're going to just pretend that that's an admirable trait right now so let's be pretty stubborn about this let's not allow the devil get into our families let's not be that be that person that he uses to to enter into our home and and wreck us life's too short it's too short for us to spend five minutes wrapped up in our and our um, conflicts and our uh, misbehavior in the family. Let's, you know, God gave us to each other to help each other, to love each other, to have a calm situation where we would grow. It's not always going to be perfect. It's, sometimes we're going to be down the valleys, but it's going to help us to enjoy the good times all the better. If you're sitting here thinking, our family is absolutely falling apart, Welcome to God's family. That's us. Don't let the, the fancy clothes fool you. Everybody in here. I preach long enough to know everybody in here has had some knockdown drag outs, has had some stuff. Maybe not lately, but folks survive those things. And you can survive these things, and things are going to get better. Your kids are going to be all right. Your parents are going to be all right if we commit to God and to each other. Would you pray with me, please?